Hey, what's up? My name's Kevin. I'm the pastor right here at the church, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, here at the church, we have three different campuses that gather on a weekly basis. We have a campus in Visalia, California. We also have a church campus in Tillamook, Oregon. And we have a third campus, which you are on right now, which is our online campus. And so whether you're watching from California, Oregon, or anywhere in the United States or the world for that matter, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us. We're currently in a series simply titled Acts, and we are going through the book of Acts one chapter at a time. So thank you so much for joining us. Grab a Bible, grab a notebook, and let's get ready to grow. Now, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, the next ex the, the, the example that I'm going to give today, it, it, it really, really, it really pains me. It really pains me to even give this example. I'm just, I'm just telling you, oh, it hurts bad. Everybody here that's been in the church for a while, you know that I like a certain football team. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts uh, used to be God's team. They've since fallen from graces, and now they're the meandering and mediocrity. But today I want to give you the tale of two teams. One team is the Indianapolis Colts. Thank you for that, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, you can go ahead and leave now. Uh, one team is the Indianapolis Colts. The other team is the New England Patriots. Now, now, here's, and this is what pains me so, it pains me so bad, is back in the day I used to say, I'm from Indiana, I used to say that I will never be an Indianapolis Colts fan until they get Jesus as their quarterback. And then all of a sudden, Peyton Manning came, and I said, close enough, let's go. <laughs> and so I started rooting for the Colts back when Peyton got drafted. Had a couple rough years or two. And then all of a sudden, there, there, there got to be a way that the Colts played football. There was a way that the offense played. There was a way that the defense played, even though it was shoddy at best at times. There was a way that they played. And they won more regular season games in a 10-year span than any other team in NFL history. They were consistently in the playoffs. They were consistently in the AFC championships. They went to the Super Bowl twice, won one. And there was a certain way that the Colts played back in that day. And it brought them championships. However, all of a sudden, the quarterback changed. And there's a different name on the back of the jersey of the Colts quarterback than what there used to be. The running back changed. And there's a different name on the back of the jersey of the running back than what it used to be. The defensive end, Dwight Freeney, he, he, he's gone. And he went to another team. Now there's another defensive end. And there's a different name on that jersey. And as the different names came in to the Colts organization, as new names came in, they brought in new philosophies. They brought in different athletic ability. They brought in a new way of thinking and a new way of playing football to where the way the Colts used to play, the standards, the way of thinking, this is Colts football. That disappeared with the arrival of new players. And as the new players came in and the Colts way went away, so did the wins, so did the playoffs, and now it's mediocre at best. And man, that pains me, but it's true. On the other hand, you've got what I used to refer as the devil's team, the Patriots. Oh, oh. Forgive me, Lord, for even going this direction, but I have to because it's true. Then you've got the Patriots. Back in the day, there was a way that the Patriots played. And when the Patriots... Got their new, I, I agree at times, but the, when, they got their, when they got their new coach, when Kraft hired Belichick, and then Belichick put in Brady, it was kind of like the trinity of football, Kraft and Belichick and Brady. And as long as they are there, there is a way that the Patriots play. And you can put whatever name you want on the back of the jersey, you can put in Tom Brady, you can take Tom Brady out. You can put in Gronk, you can take Gronk out. You can put in a diff different defensive end, you can put in whomever you wish. There is a way that the Patriots play. There's a way that the Patriots answer questions 
during the, the interviews. And it's always something like this. Hey, Belichick, um, what's going on with Gronk? Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a game tomorrow, and uh, that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on the game. <laughs> hey, Tom, I heard you hurt your hand. What's going on? Well, I'll tell you what, we've got a game on this Sunday, and I'm just going to focus on the game. And hey, what's going on? I'm going to focus on the game. Hey, it doesn't matter. It's like robots. They are the same. They interview the same. They play the same. You can put in the uh, uh, um, Bissett used to be the quarterback of the Patriots. When he was with them, he won games. Bissett comes to the Colts and he loses. They play the same way every game, year after year, year after year. And it doesn't matter the name on the back of the jersey because they play the way the Patriots play. And if you don't, you're not on the Patriots. And they've won, and they've won, and they've won. Now, this reminds me a lot of a, the, the only passage of Scripture we're going to sit on today and talk about. It's not found in Acts, but it's this passage here. And this reminds me the difference, the tale of two teams of the Colts had a way, new players came in, that way went away. The Patriots have a way, new players come in, and it's still the Patriots' way. It reminds me of this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing, perfect will. And what this passage is basically telling us is that as we go from playing on a different team and we put on the jersey that says Christian, Christ follower, that we, need to, we have to no longer be walking by the patterns of the former team we played for. That we now have to put on the new patterns of the team we played for. Christian on the front. And we have to renew our mind so that when we renew our mind, we now can approve and we can walk out how God says to play the game called life. And there is this, there's a way that Christians play. There's a mindset. In the football vernacular, there, 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 there's a way we play our offense. There's a way we play our defense. There's a way we answer questions. There's a way that we think. There's a way that we act. There's things that we do. There's things that we don't do. There's a, there's a motive. There's a pattern of this team called Christian, Christ follower. And it has been the craziest thing. I, I can't believe we've been in Acts this long. I'm 47 years old. We started in Acts when I was barely 46, okay? We, I was like 46 in a few months, man. And I mean, we've been on this journey for a long time, and I've loved it. It's been a great journey. But it's, I'll be honest with you, it's been hard sometimes to come up with a creative new message going from chapter to chapter, because here's what I found. After the day of Pentecost happens in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3 is just like Acts 4. And Acts 5 is pretty much the same as Acts 6. And Acts 9 is the same as Acts 10. And Acts 15 is the same as Acts 12. And Acts 28 and Acts 22, they're very similar. It's like watching the same team play chapter after chapter after chapter, even though the names change in almost every chapter. We go from the story of Peter to the first half to the story of Paul. Then you throw in a Barnabas, you throw in an Ananias, you throw in a Paul's nephew who we don't even know his name. You, you, you throw in Lydia. You can throw, put any name you want on the back of the jersey in, Acts chapter, in, in the book of Acts. And they all play the game the exact same way. And it's been pretty hard to come up with some creative ways to talk about this because it's like... It's like Groundhog Day, the movie, that old, you know, that old movie. It's the same thing again. And here's the pattern that I've seen of these, these Christians, that people who call themselves Christ followers. Here, here's the pattern that we saw. There, 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 there's three things. Number one is, is we see that they, no matter what their name was, 
no matter what chapter it's in, they were relentless in sharing the gospel. I mean, just relentless in sharing the gospel. The second thing that we see that seems to be the Christian way of living, because it's in every chapter, regardless of the names, is they are steadfast in their faith. And the third pattern that we see is a very simple one, but man, it's so powerful as we begin to break it down, is they just simply played their part. They just played their part. Some were big, some were small, some you knew their name, some you didn't, but they just, they just did what they could do at that time. And they won, and they won, and they won, and they won. And in fact, it was said of one time that these people are turning the entire world upside down. They, they, they were Christians. And, and just breaking, we're not going to sit here a long time, because is the first thing we see is, is that they were absolutely relentless in sharing the gospel. Now, the gospel is not work hard and you get to go to heaven. That's not the gospel. That's more like karma. Christianity is not karma. Karma was destroyed on the cross when all of, all of eternity's and all of humanity's sin was dumped on Jesus, and he became unrighteous so that we could be righteous. And the gospel is simply the good news that, you know what, there's one God, his son's named Jesus, and you are a sinner. And God loved you so much that he died on the cross to take the place of your sin. And so now his goodness can now be placed on you. And you are right and standing with God because of what Jesus did. This is good news. God loves you so much that he died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. And now you can be right with him. And they, they had experienced this in their life. They had gone from death to life. They had gone from sinner to saint. They had gone from worshiping possibly many gods to now worshiping the one true God. And they, they felt the freedom. They experienced the good news. And so they relentlessly, not even when they had the opportunity to share Jesus, did they share Jesus. They relentlessly looked for opportunities to share Jesus, even knowing that they were going to be persecuted for it. And it doesn't matter the name, whether it's Paul, Paul would I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. I've experienced the gospel. I want you to experience this as well. And he would go into the streets and he would share the gospel. And all of a sudden, psh, psh, he'd get persecuted. Literally, sometimes just hit right in the face and rocks thrown at him. And what would Paul do? It reminds me a whole lot of... Do you want me, I, I, I remember the old Bruce Lee movies? Remember those where he would... I'll tell you what. I'm going to kill you right now. And the words didn't line up. Remember those movies? Well, Bruce Lee, there's a scene in one of Bruce Lee's movies. I don't remember which one it is. He's just getting a dog kicked out of him. And all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, he falls down on the ground. He gets kicked real hard in the face, and he pops right back up. You know the movie. All of a sudden, he just like pops back up, and his, 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 his lip is bleeding. And Bruce Lee does what? Huh? Oh. And then all of a sudden, it just pop, he just kills everybody. And that's like Paul. Paul goes into to a city. He's been to Corinth. He starts to share the gospel. And as he's sharing the gospel, psh, 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 poof. Oh? Ah. And then he goes at it again. The, the, Peter goes into a city, starts sharing the gospel. Bam, bam, bam. Psh. Oh? Oh. And he just goes at it again. All of them. They were relentless at not, oh, if God opens the opportunity, oh, I'll share my faith. No, no, no. They walked into the street saying, who's going to get it today? Because I'm talking to somebody and you will do. Come here. <laughs> oh, Jesus loves you. And he just goes for it. <laughs> they don't stop. They're relentless. And we see this over and over and over again. These first Christians played the game relentlessly share in the gospel. The second thing that we see is that they were steadfast in their faith. Absolutely steadfast in their faith. From Peter to Paul to Barnabas, time and time again, you see from Acts 2 all the way through 28, you, you see they knew who Jesus was. They knew what Jesus had called them to do. And they were going to do it no matter what. If you like it, I'm still going to do it. If you don't like it, I'm going to do what I'm called to do. If I'm on a ship and it gets 
overran by bad weather, I'm going to share Jesus on the ship. If I'm in the streets, if I'm in the house, if I, out in the country, it didn't matter. There was good days, there was bad days. And time and time and time again, they stood. And it reminds me of one of the letters. He said, having done all to stand. Stand. When they've worked as hard as they could to stand, and one more thing came, they just stood back up again. They were steadfast in their faith. Nothing could shake them from the course of playing the Christian way. This is how a Christian plays. This is what I'm called to do. And I know this is, but I'm going to do it. They were so steadfast. It's, it's crazy the stuff they went through that never shook them off course. And the third thing that we see, which I love, oh, I love, they just played their part. Now, we know about Peter. We know about Paul. We know about Stephen. You know, Stephen's a guy who, who uh, w- w- was killed. He was one of the, uh, 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 one of the deacons of the, the church. And we, we know of him because he was killed. But did you know that even after Stephen was killed, the other deacons, they kept doing what they were doing? We don't even know their name. We know Stephen because he, we know their name. We do know their name because it's in there, but we don't remember them. But their job, their calling was, is they're going to get, make sure that the widows are taken care of and the business of ministry is taken care of so that Peter and the other apostles can prepare messages. Even after Stephen got killed, they kept doing that. And because they played their part, people were helped. And the pastors were able to do their part. These guys just did their part. They're not talked about. They're not bragged about. They just, this is what God's allowed me to do. Ma'am, do you need food this week? And that's the part that they played. And then they died and went on to glory. But that's the part they played. There's a guy named Ananias. Now, there's two Ananiases in Acts. One doesn't end well. He dies. But there's the other one, Ananias. And he's just minding his own business. He's a Christ follower. He's serving Jehovah, and all of a sudden God tells Ananias, I need you to go down to a street called Straight and talk to a man named Saul and tell him the things that he's going to do and tell him that he's my child and tell him that he's going to be punished, that he's going to be not punished, but persecuted for my namesake. Tell him that he's going to share Jesus with the kings and and, uh, the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And Ananias didn't want to do it. He was scared. But Ananias just played his part. And he goes into that house and he knocks on the door and he sits down and he talks to Paul. There's a young lady named Lydia. She was a businesswoman. She, she's very well-to-do, most likely. She deals in purple, which means that she's dealing with purple was a very lavish color back then. And so that means she's making clothing and materials for people who have money. So she's probably doing well herself. She accepts Jesus as her Savior. She invites Paul and the apostles to rest in her home. She serves them food. She just All she does is play her part and open up her house and say, well, you stay with me. Don't, 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 don't go away. Stay with me. And she opens up her home and she feeds them food and gives them a place to rest. And then she also, she's part of the church, the new church in Philippi. But Lydia just played her part. And we could, go, we could talk about Barnabas, which is a series all on his own. Barnabas, at the beginning of Acts, he comes, to, he comes to Christ at some point. We're not sure when. But at the beginning of Acts, there's a need. And so Barnabas sells much of his possessions and land and gives money to the kingdom so that they can continue to do the work of the ministry. Later on, Barnabas sees that there's this new guy named Saul who has a bad history and he's called of God. And Barnabas is the one that bridges the gap from Saul to the disciples where they actually accept him and listen to him. Barnabas is also the one that whenever there was a church plant up in Antioch, Barnabas said, I'll go. And he left his home, he left his family, and he goes up to Antioch and becomes a pastor of a new church. And he, he, We could go on and on and on. Ta- Paul's nephew. Nobody even knows Paul's nephew's name. Paul is getting in prison. He's getting ready to get a plot against him to kill him. And Paul's nephew hears of it, and he's the one that tells Paul, who ends up telling the leader and saves Paul's life. You see, here's the thing about these people. They didn't do a whole lot, but they did their part. And what if they hadn't? 
What if Paul's nephew heard the plot against Paul and said, man, I don't want to get involved in this political mess. I'm not a real political person. I don't want to get my hands dirty. I'm just going to let this thing go. God, touch Paul, help him. Paul doesn't make it out. Paul gets killed right then. That, that means the book you're holding in your hand, every, everything past, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's for the most, it's not there. It was never written. The churches were never planted. The letters were never sent because, because Paul's dead. And most, most of it, not all of it, but most of it never happens. Why? Because Paul's nephew didn't do his part. You know, what, what if deacons, after Stephen gets, gets stoned, what, what, what if the deacons would have said, you know what, it's getting a little too rough and tumble up in here for me. I'm going back on out now. All of a sudden, she goes hungry, she goes hungry, that family goes hungry. So Peter now has to start, Peter now has to start serving food, which means he can't prepare his messages, he can't travel and speak because he's got to serve the food. And much of the things of the New Testament that happened would have never happened because unfamous men stopped doing their part. And we could go time and time and time again. This is how Christians in Acts 1 through 28 played. And they won and they won and they won. That was then. But you see, now there's been a new draft. There's been new players selected. There's new names on the back of the jersey of Christianity. And in no, no, no there's Paul's day is gone. And now there's Dave. Barnabas, his jersey's been retired. He's in the Hall of Fame. And now it's Aaron. The, the, the names have been replaced on the back of the jersey. Now it's our turn to run onto the field. And what I see in the book of Acts is as we've turned the page from Acts 28, now to Acts 29, which there's no Acts 29 because we're still living it. It's still being written. What's going to be written about our name as we carry this jersey? You see, the writer of Hebrews says, no, 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 listen, no longer, no longer carry the ways that you used to, but now be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can approve the will of God. You can run this thing the way God says to run it. I got good news for you today, and I got bad news for you today. The good news is, you're on the team. It's up to you. And that's awesome. You know what the bad news is? You're on the team. It's up to you. There's no Tom Brady. You're Tom Brady. There's no Barnabas. You're Barnabas. You are Lydia. I, I, am, I am one of the, these nameless men. I'm them. It's you. We wear the jersey now. And so because of that, how should we live? Well, how? We don't get to figure it out on our own. When you join the Patriots team, you don't get to pick how you're going to play football. You're going to play the Patriot way. When you come on the team with Jesus Christ, you don't get to pick, this is how I'm going to walk this thing out. No, no, no. Daddy done set the rules. This is how you play the game. And it's it's, it's an ax. Is what we do as Christians is, is, man, we relentlessly share the gospel by how we live, by how we speak, by what we do. We wake up in the morning and we don't think, I got this bill to pay and that bill to pay and I got this place to go and that place to go. I'm going to do this over here and do that over there. No, no. We wake up with all of those things on our mind. We wake up and say, who is it today that I'm going to share Jesus with? That's what a Christian does. We don't get to pick. And say, eh, you know what? I don't really think that's how I want to play. No. That's how you play. No longer be, don't, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't, don't think the old way of thinking. There's something more important now. And that more important thing is, is are they going to heaven? Because I'm going and I want them to go. 
And then we just figure out how can we share. As Christ followers, as people who have Christian on the front of our jersey, what, regardless of what the name is on the back, is when we, we relentlessly share faith and, and, and we are steadfast in our faith. We as Christians, when bad times come, we don't let those bad times dictate our faith and our Savior. Because yes, I know those bills are killing us and our children are running from God, and our husband is making our life a living hell. I get all of that. But none of that changes the historically proven fact that a man named Jesus died on the cross, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And after that, over 500 people saw him physically. Nothing that we will go through, come hell or high water, changes the truth of the matter that Jesus is not dead, he's alive. So because of that, we can't let big bills and stressful life and this person's in leadership now instead of them. We can't let any of that waver us. Yes, it's going to push us and yes, it's going to hurt. But having done all to stand, stand. Jesus is not dead. He's alive. I know my husband's driving me crazy. Not my husband. I don't have one. But if you're a lady, is your husband's driving you crazy. Your kids are running. I get all of that. I've been there on all fronts. But that doesn't change the fact that Jesus is alive. So that's what we hold on to. That's what, we, that's what Christians do. And that's what makes us different. Because everybody else in the world plays the game differently. They let culture and what's good and what's bad dictate how they think. Our mindset has already been transformed. Jesus is God's son. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And it doesn't matter anything else. I'm standing firm on that. That's how we play the game. And the other way we play the game is we just do our part. What, what's your part? I don't know. You know what? It's, it's going to change. It, it'll change from time to time. Barnabas gave some money. Then Barnabas was a bridge builder. Then Barnabas planted a church. And then he partnered up with Paul again. His, the part that he played changed. And here's, here's, something, here's something that I learned in leadership a long time ago. One of my mentors told me. And I love it. He said this. He said, when you say yes to the why, the what no longer matters. When you say yes to the why, the what you do no longer matters. So going back to the football analogy, why are you playing today? To win. That's why I'm playing. I'm playing to win. Now what do I have to do to make that happen? It doesn't matter anymore. I'll block for him. He can block for me. I'll be the water boy. I don't care the role I play. I'm playing to win. And that's how it is with us as believers. What we do for the kingdom is not of much consequence. We say yes to the why. And then when we see what we could do and we have a chance, we just play our part. You just play. And there's so many ways that we play our part. There's so many ways we can play our part. And then just real quick, I, I think we have a little video that, that Jordan made today. He's working with the student ministry and the people that are volunteering their time to do so. So he just, he's got a little, little video about just playing people that play their part when it comes to just one aspect of the kingdom, and that's the student ministry here. So go ahead and roll that video. Hey everybody, Jordan Moore here from the church. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our youth ministry here called Echo. Every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. right here at the church, junior hires and senior hires gather together. We take some time to worship Jesus. We talk about Jesus a little bit, and then we have some meaningful discussion talking about how the message applied to us and how we can walk out of Echo and into our everyday life and apply the Bible uh, to how we live. Man, Echo is a great opportunity for your children, your, your, your students to come, hear the Word of God, worship Jesus, and build some great community with some godly people. It's a really cool deal, and I just wanna number one say thank you. Thank you to you as a church for supporting us to where we can put on this incredible event every Wednesday night for your teenagers. Also, I want to let you know, if you want to play a part, maybe you want to jump in and be a part uh, of the Echo ministry, here's a couple ways you can do that. You can, uh, number one, invite people. If you know someone, a parent of a teenager, invite their, their teenager out to Echo. We would love to have them get to know them and point them to Jesus. Also, you can roll up your sleeves and serve. Man, we have opportunities all over the place at Echo for you to get involved and be a part of this life-changing event every Wednesday night for teenagers in the Visalia area. Thank you so much for being a church that not only hears the Word of God, but like the Bible says, 
does the word of God. You guys roll up your sleeves and give, and you roll up your sleeves and serve, and because of your sacrifice and because of your servanthood, we're able to put on an incredible event for teenagers every Wednesday night. So once again, thank you so much. Literally, that right there, that's just like one one tiny little fraction of, of people playing their part. Whether it's inviting someone, whether it's giving financially, whether it's you know, the, the, the 10 or so volunteers that are serving, it, it's, it's a part. And, and it makes a difference. And there, there, there's so many examples I could give of this of people through the years that, that have just played their part. And it's not been, at the time, it, it just did not seem like much in, in any way, shape, or form. But I remember, there's just a small one. I, I remember a girl by the name of Christina. And I was uh, a youth pastor and I was picking up kids in my van. I know that sounds weird, but I was picking up kids. <laughs> I was, uh, as soon as I said it, I was like, that's... I was, I was, I, I was heading up a van ministry, picking up students with another, with another trained individual in my van. And we were going around town. And when parents would give us permission, we would pick up their children and bring them to church. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that just sounded really odd. But anyway, um, Christina's in the, in the car. There's another young man in the, in the van with us as well. And we're, we're driving down the, the road, and we see this, we see this young man, and he's, he's on the side of the road. And Christina realizes, man, I, I, he's, my, he's my friend from school. I might invite him next week. Cool. So we go on, we do our deal, do the youth service. Well, sure enough, next week, Christina comes and says, hey, he wants to come. All right, cool. Let's pick him up. So we go to his parents' house. We talk to his mom. His, his dad wasn't a part of his life, and we talk to his mom, and his mom says, sure. She signs the parental form, and off we go. Picked a young man up for church on Wednesday. Picked him up every Wednesday. And the young man ends up going through our student ministry, and we, we moved away. But this young man stayed in the church, and he stayed in the student ministry. And then I'm watching on Facebook, and this guy goes off to a, a little internship college thing. And then he's involved in a, in, a, in a band. And then he starts a band. And now he travels in a band singing worship all, all over the Midwest, and he also is a worship, on the worship team at a local church. This, this young boy is, in, this young man now, he's a man. This young man is impacting hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ every single week now. And if someone was writing the story of Acts 29, the writer would say, and there was a girl named Christina who saw her friend and she invited him to church. And that's all it would say. And Christina played her part. And that young man has carried on the gospel. And that's going to be said of you, and of you, and of you, and of you. If we will simply put on the Christian jersey and say, who can I share the gospel with today? And how? I know life's not great, but you know what? Jesus is alive. And I know it, and I believe it, and I'm not bending from that he's alive now how can i help well we need to give a little bit of finance i'll give a little bit oh we, we need to some, i could help there well I, I can't make a commitment for like forever but i can be there the next two weeks that's christian and i've seen it in acts three four five six seven eight nine acts ten eleven 12, 13, 14, 15. We talked about it in Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Acts 21, what do you think? It was Acts 21, it was Acts 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, and 28. And now the page is turned, your name's been called, and you now wear the jersey. And what will they write about you? In Acts 29. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity that we have. The amazing opportunity to be on the team. Jesus, you, you called our name. 
we, we said yes, and we're on the team now. And Lord, I thank you for the great example that the, the, the players of the past generations have played. And God, now that it's our name on the jersey, that it's our life that has been redeemed, that it's our story that's being told, let us wake up every morning, not with the weight of, oh, this is how it, but with the joy of being on a winning team and playing the way that winners play. That God, that we will be relentless in sharing the gospel by the way we live, by opportunities we have to speak, that we'll know how good, and how good it is to be a Christ follower. And we won't be ashamed to share that. God, let us, let us wake up in the morning and be steadfast in our faith. Even though the waves of life are crashing all around, let us be reminded of the fact that Jesus Christ is, is not dead. He's alive. And no matter what's going on around our life does not change this truth that we hold on to. That we serve a risen God who's alive in us and sits at the right hand of the Father making mediation for us for God. God, let us, let us wake up every day and just, just play our part. Whether that's playing our part and, and being the, the, a godly spouse, whether it's playing our part in raising our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, whether it's playing our part in saying no to something that our children are wanting to do and holding fast to that, even though it's going to be tense in the home, let us play our part. Let us play our part by, by, by giving. Let us play our part by serving. Let us play our part by, by, by making a commitment. I'm going to do this for a season, or I'm going to help out there for a season. And many times, Lord, we feel like it's so small. God, all, all Lydia did was, was invite Paul to her home and allow them a night to rest and to eat a good meal. And then she kind of goes into the background of a church in Philippi. But eternity knows the difference that that made in Paul and his, his men's life. The hundreds of people that came to Christ in that church in Philippi, all because of this woman that just said, you know what, I've got a house and I've got some food and you all are welcome to stay. God, let that be our heart. That today we don't have to do some grand, grandiose thing and hear from God in this way or move in a certain big way. We just got to wake up in the morning and say, what, what could I do to shine Jesus and make my little world a better place? God, let us do our part. Because we're on your team. And we no longer think as we used to think. We play the game the way our coach says to play it. We play the game the way our master says to play it. And God, we relentlessly share the gospel. God, we are steadfast in our faith. And God, show us what to do and we'll just play our part. And because of it, eternities upon eternities upon eternities will be changed. And we thank you for this opportunity, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.